Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Yes. So I'm going to give a quick rundown on some Susquehanna River fisheries issues. Maybe. All right. So I'm going to talk about the population status of smallmouth bass, um, some of our smallmouth bass research, and a little bit about my, my newest topic I've been working on, which is flathead catfish research. So I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with what's going on with smallmouth bass. Um, but beginning in 2005, uh, we saw disease-related mortality of uh, smallmouth bass, almost exclusively of young of year smallmouth bass or fish that were spawned in the spring of each year. Um, based on the reproductive ecology of smallmouth bass, they have few large year classes. So every couple of years have a really large year class. Unfortunately, we saw disease during these years, which drastically affected recruitment or new fish coming into the population. And as a result of this, we saw population level declines from 2005 through the late 20 teens. As a result of this, we imposed some regulatory changes that affected people's fishing ability. So in 2011, we put a regulation in place that limited fishing during the spawn of popular fishing period, and also uh, uh, installed catch and release fishing. So there was no harvest anymore of smallmouth bass with this, in the stretch of the river. In 2018, we relaxed those regulations some and allowed fishing during the spawn, but still have maintained the closure on harvest for smallmouth bass in this reach of river. Disease prevalence uh, began to wane in 2012. We started to see a decrease in the prevalence of disease, and it's kind of decreased over time, with the exception of one anomalous year in 2020, where we did see some disease in the population, but didn't seem to have a substantial effect in year class strength. Here is the data, uh, our catch rate data from our electrofishing surveys during late summer of each year, looking at the abundance of smallmouth bass in the river. Uh, this time frame goes from 1990 to 2020. Unfortunately, it ends in 2020. High flow events uh, this summer uh, kind of kept us off the river during our key time to sample small bass. We missed a year in our time series years. So we're hoping to, to get back to it in 2021 and update some of these numbers. But over time, you can see our catch per unit of effort or the number of fish we catch in our electrofishing has varied um, with high catch rates in the 90s, followed by a period in the early 2000s with low catch rates that resulted from the disease I discussed earlier. And in recent years, as the disease waned, we've seen an increase back to near normal um, abundance from 2013 through about 2020. A similar graphic looking at the catch rate of 15 inch and larger fish, uh, the fish anglers most are looking to catch, we see we've had an increase in that catch rate over time. In the past four or five years, have actually some, been some of our best catch rates of fish over 15 inches. In this graphic, we're looking at a common fisheries management uh, metric called proportion, proportional size distribution or PSD. And it's basically a measure of large fish to small fish in the population. Most populations, they wanna see somewhere around 30 or 40% of our fish meeting this threshold. Unfortunately, when we had disease like we had in the Early to, early to mid 2000s, we see many more larger fish in the population. We actually cross a threshold where there's not enough functional report, reproduction to support the population. This threshold we see here is, is kind of indicated by the 60 line. Since kind of we've seen recruitment improve, we see we're now well below that line again. We've been hovering down there the past few years. Um, this is kind of indicative of this rebound we've had uh, since disease has waned. And this is really a kind of a portion of this metric, we want to stay in 30, 40% um, going forward. So kind of in summary, we've seen a rebound in the smallmouth bass population in recent years. This was really facilitated by strong 2012, 2015, and 2019 year classes. We think 2020 was good as well, but we didn't get to monitor it this year in the fall. So we really don't have a good feel for it, but it looked pretty good when we were out there in, in the fall of 2020. Uh, the 2015 year class, that, uh, the strongest one I've seen since I've been here, uh, is now reaching trophy size or 17, 18, 19 inches in length. And this summer's fishing for them should be pretty good. And we have a really high density of fish from 10 to 12 inches that is that 2019 year class, which was also quite large. Throughout the course of this uh, disease time period, we've been conducting a large amount of smallmouth bass research. And this stretch of the 
Susquehanna River and, and some of the adjoining stretches probably has the most studied population of fish of anywhere in North America. If it's not the most, it's very close to being the most heavily studied population of fish. And we've looked at various aspects of fish health, population genetics, and fish movement and how they move about the system. We've been using that <clears throat> to inform our regulations for, for smallmouth bass and not only the river, but some other tributaries as well. One of the more interesting research projects we've been working on, and one I probably get the most questions about, is a condition called a hyperpigmented melanosis or blotchy bass syndrome. And these fish in these pictures, you can kind of see the black markings on each of them, is indicative of this condition. Um, it's been documented in North America since the 1980s. Um, Susquehanna River isn't unique in having it, but it's probably the most well known cases because of the media popularity we had with disease uh, in the 2000s. Um, my colleagues, from USGS that I've been working with on this project for years have recently found this to be actually associated with a novel virus. Um, many different ideas were had over time of what was causing this, but uh, it was actually kind of surprising to find that this is a response to a virus. Um, we, we think we see some seasonal patterns in its occurrence. It seems to occur more during cold weather periods. So late fall through early spring of each year. Um, and I'm continuing to work on some seasonal surveys to try to better understand this relationship and hopefully kind of tie some of loose ends together about how they transmit the virus and, and what it's doing in these populations. Overall, we don't think it's harmful to fish. We don't see mortality as a result of it. Just this mark uh, coloration pattern that occurs and we think dissipates um, during different times of the year. Kind of last bit of information I wanna kind of pass on today is some of the flathead catfish research we've been working on the past few years. Flathead catfish are an invasive species to the Susquehanna Basin. They're native in the Western part of the state but they've been introduced in the Susquehanna and Delaware basins. We first documented the Delaware River, or in Susquehanna River, I'm sorry, in 2002. And we've had some recent research efforts in cooperation with Penn State to track abundance, distribution, growth rates, and their diet since they moved in. And I mentioned diet because they're actually almost an obligate piscivore, meaning they eat primarily fish, unlike most other catfish species. And in this top picture here, if you're looking down the mouth of a flathead catfish, it has a very large walleye tail sticking out of its mouth. So they do have possibly impacts on our fisheries. Uh, so we're trying to understand what role they have and what's going on in our ecosystem. And that is my last slide, Dee. So if you wanna take over and drive for here, I can stop my sharing and you can go on. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint for you folks this evening. I'm not a PowerPoint kind of girl. I'm usually out there hands-on in the public um, doing fishing and boating type programs. So that's what I'm used to doing, not having the PowerPoints. But I thought that I would follow Jeff um, on his talk just because of the fact that with his information that was out there, even though I don't have the scientific research, I do talk to anglers almost on a daily basis. We, we write up regional reports uh, for each of the six regions of the state. And, and we hear from the anglers, we hear from our waterways conservation officers that are out there and they're talking with our anglers and boaters. And we've heard nothing but the fact that the fishing is fantastic in the Susquehanna River last year. Um, it's one of the best, uh, seasons that, that folks have had in recent history. Um, on any given day, you know, uh, we can see uh, lots and lots of anglers out on their boats around the, um, the Statue of Liberty off, off of uh, Fort Hunter there. Um, you know, sometimes we see as much as, you know, 80 to 100 boats just around that area there. Uh, so, so we know that uh, folks are out there and they're having a great time and they are catching fish and they're catching good fish and they're happy about it. So what I wanted to talk uh, with folks this evening is just kind of give you some of the basics. I did see that through the list of our speakers this evening, you know, we're going to be talking, you know, with expert fishing guides and we're going to talk to people um, who, who are out there on the on the trails and the water trails and that sort of thing and outfitters. So I don't wanna take anything away from them. So most of what I'm going to be uh, referencing is probably what you might already know, but it's the basics. And if nothing else is, is said or you take away nothing else from me this evening, the most important thing that I wanna say is to please you know, wear your life jacket out there. Life jackets save lives. It's so important that you wear your life jacket when you're out on the, on the water. 
Um, we have a mandatory cold water wear uh, law that goes in effect from November 1st through April 30th. And as the, you know, the temperatures start to warm up and we feel, you know, the, the spring air is out there and we're anxious to get out on our boats, keep in mind that, you know, the water is still cold. So please uh, make sure that you, you know, continue to wear your life jackets and follow the regulations in the boating handbook. And if, if you don't have one, this is, you know, like it's a copy of one that I have here in my hand. Uh, you can access it easily from our website, fishandboat.com. All of our literature, all of our publications, all of our regulations can all be found on, um, on our website. And if you'd like to have the hard copy, you can get it uh, just by requesting it. And we'll send it to you if you can't pick one up at a, you know, a sports show uh, or you know, at a local bait and tackle shop, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, of course, besides uh, having your life jacket, which is a mandatory piece of, of equipment, if you're gonna be going fishing, you do of course need to have a fishing license. And again, um, you can get your fishing license online now. Um, it's, it's easy to do. We have a new website that we just introduced last year. It's called huntfishpa.gov uh, and you can order your fishing license online and there's no display requirement anymore. So you can uh, just do it online, save the PDF. Uh, you can carry it on your phone just so long as you, you have it, but you no longer have to display it. Um, if you wish to, it's your option and you can still do that, of course. But we wanna make sure that you do have your fishing license. And if you are going out uh, and utilizing a fish and boat ac boating access or a state park uh, to do your fishing, of course, we are talking about the Susquehanna River and there are plenty of Fish and Boat Commission accesses along the river. You do need to have um, a launch permit if you are using a non-powered vessel or you would need, of course, to have your boat registered if you have a power boat or if you're going to be going out on a personal watercraft. So make sure that you have uh, required documentation. If you are going to be going out on a, a personal watercraft um, or you are going to be using a power boat, you need to make sure, uh, find out if you need to have a boater safety education certificate. Uh, again, you can get that by taking an online course, or you can visit our calendar of events pages on our website, and you can register for an in-person course. And if you don't know whether or not you need to have one, uh, we can discuss that at the uh, end of the presentations if there's time, but all of the answers to all of your questions can of course be found on our website. So um, that's pretty much what I just wanted to cover in the basics so that I could save time for everybody else to have theirs, but I am available to answer questions at the end. And I wanna thank you all for having us. I'm very excited. Remember, wear your life jacket, have your fishing license and make sure that you either have your launch permit or your boat registered. Thanks so much. Caleb, back to you. Thank you so much, Dee and Jeff. That was great. Perfect way to start off this lecture. Um, so next on our list of speakers this evening is Shane Hershey. He is the former owner of Susquehanna Shane. Some of you may have heard of that. Uh, he is going to go over how to obtain a guide service, kind of how to look for one and how to prepare for that. And he's also going to go over how to catch bass and, and flatheads like Jeff was talking about. So he's going to touch on some of those topics and I will pass this over to Shane. Hi Shane, thanks for joining us. Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, I guess I'm good, right? I want to thank Jeff for his information that um, as a fisherman myself, uh, that was some good information and uh, is very useful. Um, so I want to touch base. I, I heard the words Fort Hunter and being a boater myself, uh, we kind of have a rule. So if you're not familiar with um, Fort Hunter, uh, if it's under four foot, 
probably not the best idea to run the boat up through there unless you have a, a rock proof or, or something with the UMHW hull or just the overall skill and uh, knowledge in order to navigate uh, that waterway specifically. Um, it is a fantastic place to fish. There's a ton of boats that go out there. Um, so if you can do it, uh, get out there, do it. it. It is a great time. The walleye and the bass just stack up in there. And uh, in the last probably 10 years, I would say the flatheads actually get up in there pretty well. Uh, also, mostly do, of course, to the other fish. Um, but with that being said, if you're, you're not running your own boat and uh, you want to get a guide service, uh, last time I counted, I think there was 67 guides uh, that, have, that are permitted to guide in, uh, in Pennsylvania and the Susquehanna. And uh, <laughs> as myself for doing one, if you're going to find a guide, figure out first maybe which area you want to fish, what part of the river do you want to fish, because it goes the whole way from New York all the way down to Maryland. And it's over 400 miles of river. So the guides are, they're not all willing to drive hours, you know, to, to take you to a specific spot. So make sure you research where you want to go. Um, go on the PA, uh, Fish and Boat Commission's website, check out their guide listing. They have, they have them all in there. I don't wanna point out any one in, spe in specific, um, just out of fairness, but uh, check them out, call them up, ask what's biting. If, if you're going after bass, my opinion, if you can get a guide trip pre-spawn or in the fall, we talked about this earlier, September uh, would be a great time when that feedback comes on. It's almost a guarantee. If you get one of these guides out there, they could probably put you on 50 to 100 fish in a day. Um, but it is fishing. So, you know, if, if they only do, you know, five or 10, 20 fish is what it is. But those, that time of the year is, is really, uh, those guys can get you on the fish. It's really good fishing. So, <laughs> If you want to do it on your own, what you can do, smallmouth fishing, I always start real simple. I like to take it and I go deep. I always go deep and I, then I work my way to the shallow. And the reason for that is I find that I catch the bigger fish in deeper water. Uh, for me anyway, in my experience, nine times out of 10, if I'm gonna get the bigger fish, it's gonna be on a ledge of deeper water or it's gonna be down at the very bottom of the hole. Uh, unless it's early morning, late evening, typical textbook stuff, you can beat up the banks, you can beat the shallow flats, you got some grass, and then you can fish the edges of the grass. But for me, when I go out, first thing I do is I go to the deepest channel, and I start working that ledge, and if they're not on that, there's nowhere else to go but the shallower water. And deep on the Susquehanna, if you're not familiar with it, I would say from the Harrisburg up, I would say if you're in 10 foot of water, 15 foot of water is probably pretty deep because um, most of it's uh, about knee deep. Um, that's why we use jet boats primarily until you get south, you get into Long Level and uh, Lake Aldred, Lake Clark, you know, all those uh, lake areas down there where you can actually see 100, 120 foot of water. Um, now there, I will not go to the deepest hole, okay, but from the Harrisburg area up, maybe even Marietta up, um, probably all the way up towards New York, because it just gets skinnier as, it, as the river goes up, I'm going to work the deepest hole, and, I'm gonna, and if they're not in the deep, I'm going to work the ledge, and then come right up into the shallow, and you don't have to go to a whole bunch of spots to do this, you can do this pretty simple. What I would do if... Uh, I have my own way of fishing, but what I would do if I wasn't 100% sure is I'd tie on a tube jig. Everybody knows about the tube jig. This is nothing new, um, but it works and it, it will probably always work. The, uh, the other one would be a Ned rig, especially this time of year when the water is cold the way it is. Now, right now, I think it was at 130,000 CFS this morning, which means it's flowing pretty good. And I believe it's somewhere around nine foot. Um, Ned rig might be kind of hard to do unless you get in some eddies, um, which they'll, they'll be in there, but I'm looking, I'd be looking at something a little more weight. I'd be looking at a tube. I'd be looking at something with a rattle with all this high muddy water that we're going to have. And it's going to fluctuate like that until spring's over. 
and then summer will lay down and get a little clearer. But back to what I was saying, uh, tube jigs, it's, it's, it's almost a given. You take a tube out there and you throw it enough, you're gonna catch them. And then when you do find them, especially in this cooler water, you're gonna find one after another, after another, after another. Um, but jigging aside, a more fun way, for me anyway, would be jerk baits. I love throwing a stick bait. And three and a half to four inch is, is my go-to. Uh, I typically throw a shallow diving stick bait, slow sinking, um, whether you do like a countdown, I try to keep them close to the bottom. Um, it's just a blast. Uh, flathead catfish, something else uh, we can touch base on. I got obsessed with these things. Probably 2006, 2007. Leave, the, leave your stink base at home. Uh, chicken liver, leave all that stuff at home. You want to catch a flathead catfish? Try, I believe in indigenous fish. I believe in indigenous bait. Try to get the bait from the waterway that you're going to fish. Try not to haul bait from ponds and lakes and take them out to the river. I, I guess there's potential for disease, but I feel like the bait that you're going to catch out of the river system is going to be a lot uh, healthier, uh, livelier. Um, I'm trying to find the best word for that. They're going to last longer on your hook. I've found that if you take them from a pond, like especially a bluegill, and you put them on a hook, you get them out there, they're going to wiggle a little bit and die. That's not the best for flathead catfishing. I'm going to tell you that right now. My, my preference for bait flathead catfishing is green sunfish and rock bass. Those two baits right there are they're killers. They're just straight killers for flathead catfish. The green sunfish will stay alive for even up to hours on your hook soaking out there. So now you're probably thinking, all right, well, I got my bait, I got my hook. Well, your hook, let's start there, should be for a flathead catfish. I like to use either an eight out or a 10 out. And the reason for that is the size of your bait. Um, and you're gonna get online, look, look, see how to hook them. I will throw this tip at you with the, use a circle hook, eight to 10 knot. When you put the hook through the, the back of the fish, do it on an angle, do not go straight through. And I learned this the hard way. I've lost a lot of big fish because of this until I finally figured it out. If you put that hook on an angle through the back, it cannot lay over and the hook point cannot get in the side of the fish. So a little tip there, check it out, you know, do your internet research, but, um, Finding flathead catfish, it's gonna sound a lot like how I find bass. Um, <laughs> I look for holes and when I say holes, it could be a hole that is 50 yards long and it's only two or three deep feet deeper than the rest of the, the column or the floor around it. That's all it takes. Um, it could just be with flathead, it could just be a hole the size of the top of a 55 gallon barrel. They will lay in that. I look for deep holes, I look for structure, logs, overhanging rocks, those kind of things. They will stage up in there, primarily during the day. Now at night, it's, it can be really hard to go to their house where they live and catch them or find out where their feeding zone is. So what I do is I get them in the transition. And with flathead catfish, you can catch them in the transition between their, where they stay during the day and their feeding zone, pretty much simply by just fishing ledges. If you throw a bait on the top of a ledge, in the middle of a ledge, and at the bottom of a ledge, you're allowed three poles per person, right? Yeah, three poles per person, three hooks per line. So you can do that. You can put one at the bottom of the ledge, one right in the middle, and then one up top sit there and wait, it's kind of like archery hunting. You just sit there and wait and you'll let them come through. Um, you, you will catch them that way. In the springtime, when they start to spawn, it's gonna be later spring, at least in my experience, I'm thinking almost June. Feeder creeps, hit those feeder creeps up. Um, it's easier going water, 
It generally has an eddy somewhere nearby, a, a calm spot of water. And there's also a ton of food there. If they really want to eat, it's there. I'm not 100% sure other than water temperature and current as to uh, why they go up there. I'm thinking that they will eat too. Maybe not the one nesting, but it's partner mine. Uh, the only reason I say that is in some of the tournaments I've done, I've got uh, my butt handed to me a couple times by uh, guys fishing Peter Creeks that time of the year. And I learned the hard way. And I took their advice and I went out and found out, well, they're right, that's where they're at. Um, during the winter time, believe it or not, they don't shut down. The winter time, I don't wanna burn any spots, but if you go to the deeper parts of the river, which is gonna be south of Harrisburg, and you find 20, 30, 40, 50 even foot of water, you have sonar, you'll see them. You'll see them laying down there. It's gonna look like a big rocky bottom on, on a sand bed. I've run cameras down through and see these things stage up by the hundreds. At this point, leave your live bait at home. Start chunking creek chubs, um, sunfish. If you can get them, it's wintertime. If you ice fish, you know, or something, maybe you can pull them out of a lake up north or, or get them out of a local pond somewhere, but save them from the fall. Cut them up, put them in your free, uh, fill your bags full of water, freeze them, save them for the, for the wintertime, your bait. And you can catch these guys all winter, right in the spring. And uh, hogtober, October, get out there, put the biggest bait you got. If you got a 13 inch sunfish or a rock bass, put it on there with a 10 knot circle hook, find your ledge, cast it out, and you will do some serious damage. Um, on that, that's about all I got to offer. <laughs> Kayla? Okay. Thank you, Shane. That was great. I definitely took some notes of some of the things that you were mentioning about. Um, so we really appreciate that. And next, we are going to head over to Brooke Lanker. He is the executive director of the Keystone Trails Association and co-founder of the Susquehanna River Trail Association. Uh, in his presentation, Brooke is going to share some of the brief history of the water trails movement and water trails in PA. He's explained the creation of the Susquehanna River Water Trail, the middle section here, uh, provide an overview of the trail, its scope, geography, management, characterize its use and popularity, and also describe how to explore it and get involved in its stewardship. So Brooke, thank you very much for joining us as well this evening. And I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thanks Kayla. Thanks. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. I am, I'm glad to be here to tell you, uh, I, guess, I guess I'm gonna provide a kind of an introduction, hopefully a fairly thorough, thorough introduction to the Susquehanna River Trail. When I say that, I guess I should specify that I'm talking about the um, Susquehanna River Water Trail middle section. And the, that water trail spans about 52 miles from Sunbury to Harrisburg. It uh, came online in 1998. And then after a few more years of work, we extended it. So initially it went from Halifax to Harrisburg and then later uh, it went the whole way uh, up to Sunbury. So I, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about what all that means. <laughs> um, but I wanna start by just kind of characterizing this corridor for you, um, give you a better idea uh, of what it's like, and, and of course, some of you are probably very familiar with it already. But one of the things I think is notorious about that section of the river is the wildlife, whether it's the, uh, the, the scores of great egrets that nest on um, the, uh, the island known as Wade Island near Harrisburg, 
or a plethora of other species of birds and mammals and um, just all sorts of um, fauna that you can that you can find on the river. It's uh, it's a wonderful place for wildlife. But perhaps the, the one of the most special features are the islands. Um, so this section of the river is really unlike any other part of the Susquehanna, or for that matter, probably any other river in Pennsylvania. In Dauphin County alone, there's an estimated 375 miles, or excuse me, 375 islands. Um, and if you look at that whole corridor that incorporates Northumberland County as well, there's probably close to 500 islands. So that makes this section very unique. And there's, I just like to think there's, there's something really um, captivating about spending time on these islands. Um, certainly the history is a part of this, of the river that's really special too. Um, whether it's the Native American trails that followed it or the artifacts that are still found or, um, or the architecture like the Rockville Bridge, which is uh, the longest stone arch railroad bridge in the world or the relics of the Pennsylvania Canal. Um, there's lots of history in this part of the river. And there are also some great towns and communities and I think more and more, they're reconnecting to the river. They're seeing it as an amenity that, um, that uh, is enlivens those places. And that's manifest in initiatives like the Susquehanna Greenway Partnership um, that, and those, those connections are enhanced further. But uh, you also may know that the, Susquehanna uh, near Harrisburg, just north of Harrisburg, is designated by the uh, US Department of the Interior as a, nat nat I have to say this slowly, a national natural landmark. And it's given that designation because of the water gaps. There are five consecutive water gaps. And that's in, a water gap alone is a, sort of a special geologic phenomenon. So when there are five of them lined up, that's even more um, extraordinary. So there's a marker at Marysville about the, the water gap designation. I also like to just re remind folks too that the river here and elsewhere is special because it's the mother river to the Chesapeake Bay. Half of all the fresh water going into that estuary comes from the Susquehanna River. So what is this water trail um, exactly? Well, it has different components. And one of those is the guide. The map and guide uh, really underscore your experience on the trail. So the guide has information about, uh, the, about the flora, fauna, geology, history. Um, it has safety information. It, ha it has inset maps that show you how to navigate and find, navigate to and find these different island campsites. So the guide, the guide is a real essential part of that experience. And we had uh, two previous guides. Uh, the last one prior to the new one had been published in 2003. So the guide was getting a little bit outdated, but the River Trail Association partnered with uh, PA Parks and Forest Foundation uh, with some funding from uh, DCNR and the Pennsylvania Environmental Council to enable this new guide that was just published last year. And it updates all the, the campsite information um, and really uh, helps, again, under, really helps you have a positive experience on the trail. Of course, the islands themselves, as already mentioned, uh, are really the key, the integral part of the river trail experience. And we have about 23 campsites, I believe, on about 20 islands. Uh, and they're generally fairly evenly dispersed along that corridor. So there are campsites, you know, every few miles in general. Um, and you, you can't reserve them, but typically, you know, you can, you can find one available. Another important part of uh, 
the, the river trail or this is the signage. Um, our section has uh, signs at about 10 different access points that, that orient you to the river and to the water trail. The signage uh, also uh, goes to the islands. So you'll see these, these symbols, these signs, um, these big ones at the perimeter of the islands. So when you see those, you know you're at one of the designated islands. And, um, and then at the campsite, you'll see this. So you'll see a post with a smaller version of that campsite symbol sign. You'll also see a sign that has a number on it. And that's your campsite number. And those correlate to miles from the Chesapeake Bay. In other words, at this site, you're 112 miles from Haver de Grace, Maryland, the mouth of the river where it goes into the bay. You're 112 miles upstream. So the middle section water trail goes uh, from about mile mark 121 or 22, I believe, at Sunbury to about uh, number, mile number 71 or 70 at Harrisburg. So, that, so that's, we came up with those 52 miles. So 112 puts you at about roughly Port Treverton or that, that area, I believe. You'll also see in this picture, an ammunition box that's mounted to the post. You open that up, inside's a plastic box, and inside that is the logbook where folks can record their visit. They can say where they're from and how many people are with them and all that kind of thing. And that helps give us some data on the use that's occurring. We can glean how many people are using the islands um, and maybe where they're from and, and how big their party is. You know, how many people are typically using the site at one time? So that's really helpful data. On top of the post, you'll see, um, you should see <laughs> this uh, leave no trace placard that has some of the guidelines for using the site. So these are positively worded practices that um, correlate nicely with the regulations that the Bureau of Forestry has for state forest land. So they kind of reinforce one another. But uh, uh, that's an important point that I neglected to mention earlier, is that these islands where these campsites are located are Bureau of Forestry land. They're managed by the Bureau of Forestry, but of course cooperatively with uh, the, the assistance of the SRTA. The sites also have a clearing for you know, a few tents. Some, some are a little bit larger than others. And we have these campfire rings. They're very similar to what you might see at a state park. In fact, I think we use the same vendor, but um, you can cook on them and they're, they're nice and sturdy. And more and more of the campsites have picnic tables, not all of them, but we have been expanding the number of sites that have picnic tables. So this gives you a good idea of what you can expect to see out there. Um, but, but very importantly, I like to remind folks that uh, it's a really good idea not only to have the map and guide, but also to have a GPS or a way that you can check where you are uh, with coordinates. Um, because some of the islands are, are difficult to find. Uh, there are so many of them, some of them sort of overlap. So it's easy to get confused. Um, and, and those tools help a lot. So these are just a, a, this is just a close up of those leave no trace principles. So you can see what they are. Um, what we found is, you know, probably one of the most important guidelines is about human waste. Not a pleasant topic, but uh, our policy is to have people uh, pack out their waste. Um, and, um, and I'd say in general, people follow that. Uh, we don't have a, a major problem. And I think also, the folks know that to a, at a minimum, to use the cat hole technique that you would normally use uh, in you know primitive camping uh, in a terrestrial sense. So um, that the, doing that helps, but ultimately folks should be carrying it out because of, because we are in a an area that's prone to flooding, um, and we don't want to have water contamination issues. It's also really important to consider water levels when you're using the trail. Um, 
generally when the river is above five feet, it can get kind of tricky. Um, you have more water flowing down it. There's, the eddies get intensified. So over five feet, you have to be really cautious, have some skill um, or advanced skills perhaps. And then when it gets lower, when it gets closer to three feet, um, it can just get very tedious. So that's the other thing you have to be careful of. You, your, your trip could get lengthened and it could be unpleasant because you're dragging your boat so much. So water levels are important. Of course, tonight's theme is recreation. So of course you can camp on these islands, but a lot of folks do enjoy fishing. We get a lot of anglers that stop at the sites, even if it's just for a lunch stop. But, um, but as we know, uh, the fishing is uh, notorious in this part of the river. Swimming's a lot of fun too. Just, uh, you know, there's lots of deep spots to swim. Snorkeling, when the, when the water gets clear, sometimes in later summer, early fall, um, the snorkeling in the river is really neat. You can see so much. You can see some of the fish that were mentioned. So uh, that's a, a, a great opportunity too. And then I already mentioned some of the wildlife, but whether it is, you know, looking at water, looking for waterfowl or, um, you know, looking at the beaver, the evidence of the beaver on some of these islands or the deer or whatever. Um, there's just a lot of different wildlife to see um, and that makes it special. So the River Trail Association, first and foremost, is all about stewardship. It's all about taking care of these island campsites. Um, and that, of course, is a, is a tall order. But um, over the years, I think the SRTA has done a pretty noble job of, of uh, executing that part of its mission. And uh, we do that in a number of ways through uh, some island work days in the spring and the fall, and then also through um, a roster of island stores of people or organizations that sign up to take care of specific campsites. Um, and that, again, it, it, it manifests itself in different ways. You know, you have to haul, sometimes you have to haul replacement stuff out there, like that, like that firing, um, or, uh, or the roster on the right, you can see that's an example of one of our year's roster of stewards. Um, you might be 20 different people working on the islands respectively. And of course, our work boat helps, uh, helps that a lot, especially in higher water or in the spring and fall, you know, work days when we have to move heavier stuff. Um, so that uh, we've had a, a, a really nice John boat uh, since about 2005. But, um, but, but the organization also has a tradition of doing a variety of other programs and projects. Uh, I illustrate some here. Uh, for years, we did something known as the Island Hopper, where we had programs on different and activities on different islands. Um, we've done a race for, for many years. Uh, we've done plantings. We've even done cleanups in the past. Um, but admittedly, uh, like many organizations, uh, some of all, we're experiencing some level of volunteer burnout and we're looking for some new folks to get involved. Um, you know, it takes any organization, takes a lot of people to make it work and work um, appropriately um, or adequately. And the SRTA certainly would welcome um, new folks, whether it's being an island steward or helping organize an event. Um, there's lots of opportunities and, and a ton of possibilities. And, you know, the significance of the, the River Trail organization is, is something I, I want to, I guess, that needs a second mention because it's not only does it have a, a neat mission to take care of these islands, which in and of themselves are pretty special, but the Susquehanna River Water Trail middle section really helps start a whole water trail wave. Uh, the founders of uh, that water trail worked with folks from the National Park Service, from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, with DCNR, with local outfitters, and helped get the water trail started, which spurred other water trails. So now there are water trails in other parts of the Chesapeake Bay watershed and in other parts of the Susquehanna Basin and across Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, the Middle Water Trail 
is a national recreation trail as designated by the Department of the Interior. And now there are, I think, nine total water trails in Pennsylvania that are national recreation trails. And there are something like 27 water trails that have been recognized by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission in Pennsylvania. So 27 water trails in PA. And they are all over the place. They could be on the Allegheny, on Clarion, uh, on uh, the Schuylkill River. Locally, we have them on uh, the Conada Gwinnett and the Yellow Breaches. So water trails are, are fairly ubiquitous, um, but it's the, that packaging, that information, um, the signage and so forth that really helps uh, give folks that sort of guided experience without a guide sometimes that, that helps get them onto the water. And again, this is a community effort. I mean, the water trail movement is uh, lifted up by different organizations, whether it's DCNR, Pennsylvania Environmental Council, the Park National Park Service, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, again, area outfitters, and then the local organizations like the SRTA that, that make it all work too. So, how many people are using the water trail? I think that's a really interesting question and, it's, and it is hard to gauge. But if we look at folks that are coming onto the islands, whether it's to stay overnight, um, which a lot of folks do, or just stopping there for lunch or for a rest or to fish, we estimate that it's probably around a thousand visitors per year. And that's based on looking at our log, logbook data in, in, in pretty good detail. Um, I don't know that we've done that uh, as much the last couple of years, but um, in the probably like 2017, 2016, we took a really good look. And that year we were up to about, yeah, I think we estimated about 923 visitors. And of course it's, that takes a lot of extrapolation. And then you have a year when you have a lot of high water uh, and it can really mess up some of those uh, visitor patterns visitation patterns, but, um, but I think that's a fair number to give a, a ballpark estimate of what's happening out there. And that number could be going up, especially when we have a good season. So um, I guess for time's sake, I, I thought I'd just wrap up with a, a few of these quotes from our log books, which I think are really kind of uh, heartwarming to hear how appreciative the users are when they go out there and, um, enjoy the river and the river trail, and just, and just the other insights they provide about where folks are coming from and how they're, how they're uh, exploring the river. So you know, these folks say, we left from Hummel's Wharf above Sealands Grove on Friday morning. We did find this wonderful site and we're glad we did. Tomorrow we'll finish at City Island in Harrisburg. Our 50 mile river trip was a real adventure. So anyway, I'll, I'll I won't read them verbatim, but you get the idea. And you see here too, the wildlife observations that this person uh, noted in their logbook entry. Or this one, just talking about what a great night's sleep they had and how grateful they were for the folks that helped take care of this. So that helped motivate the River Trail Association to keep up, keep doing what it's doing. Um, and kind of give back to all the folks uh, that presently enjoy the river and those that, that will hopefully in the future. So I leave you with just a message to please consider joining the SRTA. We welcome your involvement. Um, and if you become a lifetime member, you'll get this limited edition print of Island 109 in the river. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Brooke. That was great. Um, I know that I've used that middle trail section about many times and it's extremely helpful. I use it every summer. So that's Thanks. great. Um, all right. So next, our very last speaker for this evening is Matt DeLuca. He is the owner of Susquehanna Outfitters uh, just near City Island. He is going to talk about the river's approachability, like what to do when it's less than four feet deep, about Wade Island a little bit. Uh, floats at night that they offer, such as like the fireworks and full moon floats, and then his own experience on the river. So um, thank you, Matt.
for joining us and I will hand it over to you. All right, well, hopefully everyone can see me and hear me and a little bit of a little trouble getting on today uh, with the main internet, but uh, doing our best. Um, so basically, yeah, I mean, uh, we get a lot of people that have not, it might be their first time or, you know, they have, they, maybe they kayak once on a lake and it's their first time kind of at least kayaking on the Susquehanna River. And a lot of people have fear of it, but if you've ever walked across one of the bridges or you know, maybe walked to the shore, you can actually, most, most times in the summer, maybe not this past summer that we had, but uh, most times it's only right around like four foot or less. I think uh, two summers ago was right at about three foot. So like you would almost, walk across um but a, a lot of people are very surprised with how shallow it really is and that just makes it a little bit more approachable like a lot of people when they see how shallow it is they realize like you know like yeah i can kayak here like this is fine and when it is that shallow it's not moving very fast at all and just makes it it's a very peaceful lazy river-esque kind of uh river for for folks and as Kayla was saying, uh, yeah, we do offer a variety of trips, a lot, you know, of course in the daylight um, with our, uh, we have a birding float, as Brooke was saying, a wade island, one of the largest nesting islands for wading birds. You get your white egrets, cormorants, and uh, night herons as well, just nesting all in this. It's almost like a scene out of National Geographic and when I went down past it, I just thought, you know, we have to incorporate this somehow to get some like hands on just, you know, just seeing some of this footage is it's incredible. And uh, it was very, you just feel very special to be part of that kind of moment. Um, and then we, we do um, also do like little, tri little tributaries as well coming in um, and uh, but it's just we there's just like some fun parts as well if we're putting in at uh for a six hour trip put in at fort hunter you have those this series of two ledges which are you know, a little bit you know surprising for some people but uh very fun the playful ledges um especially we don't let anybody out at you know, dangerous levels but uh at a you know three and a half or you know, four foot, like just very fun, like almost exhilarating, get your heart, you know, heart rate and heart racing and all that and get the adrenaline going. And then it's just a nice calm ride from there. Um, and we, how much we got? okay, so we'll try to speed this up a bit. Um, so we also, we also offer some night floats, which, you know, I would not recommend anything, you know, going out at night if you have no idea where the, you, you need to have somebody who knows what's going on or have done it before. Um, but so all of our night floats, all guided all the time. Uh, we offer some wonderful uh, full moon floats. So just seeing the full moon in a different kind of light, just bouncing off the water over Sarah, or over uh, Harrisburg, over the city of Harrisburg. And it's just such a, just beautiful. It's just to see it in that kind of way is just very magical, I'd say. And then of course the fireworks floats, we all, we, we all go there for the fireworks at you know, for 4th of July or for um, Capona Fest Festival and just seeing them from the water and just seeing the light bounce off the water just adds like just so much more to it and hearing the, the echoes of the the sound, it's very cool. And then also uh, like as uh, uh, Brooke has, has done as well and maybe many, some more of you have done, um, I've uh, actually canoed the whole main branch and even the West Branch, and it's just, just seeing, it's just such a canoeable river and just so peaceful. And, you know, there's a couple spots that are just get your adrenaline going, but just, you just see so much wildlife and it's so beautiful. And it's so nice that we have people like Brooke, like just putting all these campsites here. So more people can get, like, just get exposed to it and see it. Cause once you see it, 
you really just get more involved with it. But as I'll just end with a lesson of safety because we're all about safety at Susquehanna Outfitters. Always check your gauges and you wanna check your uh, your forecast too as we're uh, actually right now dealing with the uh, high water. Um, so uh, you always wanna know like what is that now and maybe what it could be at because it could be here and then just a few hours later it might jump up a few feet which might not seem like a lot but on uh, especially smaller creeks if you're going out will be a little bit much and you know bad things have happened like catastrophic things so you just always want to check your gauges or just have somebody who knows kind of what's going on so that you like ask them like hey is it okay to go out you think and hopefully they'll give you the right answer but we always make sure we let people go out when it when it's perfectly safe. Um, I guess I'll just uh, try to wrap up now that we have a, enough time for questions. So uh, um, thanks for having me on here, Kayla. And uh, hey, thank you very much, Matt. That was great. Um, we so if you haven't been to Susquehanna Outfitters, it's a great place to go. Uh, they do lots of different floats. They have them all listed on their website as well. So again, thank you everyone who is here this evening. I know there was a lot of people, a lot of information that came through. Uh, so we are, if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the chat. Um, so someone did ask uh, why the swimming on City Island hasn't reopened after all these years. Uh, Matt just said that there just was just a lack of funding. I, I know, I thought I had saw somewhere um, and someone can pop one and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the boathouse on City Island was going to be reopening. Uh, I had read that, I don't know if it's true or if it's happened or not, but that might be something fun to do to check out as well there along the river. So there's lots of fun things that you can do on the river, fish, hike, there's lots of hiking trails as well if you're not into fishing or boating or or that type of thing. Um, let's see, Mary Lou asked, can you explain what a water gap is? I'm going to pass that or ask Brooke about that one. I think he might, or anyone really. I, I can try. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's where the river theoretically is sort of down cut through the rock. Um, but that's sort of a simplification because the, the mountains were being upfolded as the water was flowing um, over, over eons. So, um, but to, yeah, to have, to have that kind of water, the power of that water to do that, and there's a, and there's a much more detailed geologic explanation as to how it happened there and why it happened there. Um, but, yeah, it's just very unusual, especially to have five consecutive water gaps like that. But basically, yeah, the, the river there has bisected the mountain. Um, but that, again, is just sort of a, a very basic um, characterization of it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, all right, oh, and see, Savannah said that the boathouse is open. It has food and lots of fun stuff. So that might be a fun place to go this summer if you're looking for things to do. It's on City Island. Uh, let's see. I think that's all the questions we have so far. Um, and any of the presenters, if you would like to add something, maybe you didn't get to talk about, you can do that now as well. I know you only had a short little time to talk. There's, I see, I have a question um, for D, and maybe, maybe I missed this if you touched on it. Um, but where, where could you go to get your um, a boating certification, or, or who who needs a boating certification, or the safe the right. safety license? Sure. 
So I'd uh, be glad to, to answer that for you, uh, Kayla, and for the rest of the participants. So anyone who, regardless of age or when they were born, uh, that wishes to operate a personal watercraft, and by that, um, most people would think of like jet skis or ski doos. That's what a personal watercraft is. And, and then also anyone um, who was born on or after January 1st, 1982, who wishes to uh, operate a boat uh, that has a motor that is uh, greater than 25 horsepower has to have a boating safety education certificate. Uh, we actually um, do hold courses in person throughout the, throughout the state. U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary, Power Squadrons can hold courses that um, as long as they are um, all courses that would be what is called NASBLA certified and NASBLA is an acronym for um, the national, oh goodness, you're going to catch me off guard here, uh, Safe Boating <laughs> Association. But anyway, um, we do um, do our own courses that are rec recognized by NASBLA. And uh, there are also courses that are online. Uh, what, what some folks need to, to know uh, about the courses that are online, uh, they're, they're great. They, you can stop and start, take them however you want um, at your own le leisure. Uh, but there are fees that these third party vendors uh, do charge to take those courses, whereas if you would go to an in-person course that uh, Fish and Boat Commission staff um, or uh, certified instructors teach, they're all, they're all free. There is a $10 uh, fee for the actual card. Um, and and we, we do have to collect that part of course, but the, the courses are, are free and you can find them. Um, any, any boating course uh, that we would teach, any fishing course that we would teach are all uh, placed on our calendar of events page. Again, on our on our website, you can find that right from the home uh, home page for our website. And for anybody um, you know that has our Fish Boat PA mobile app, maybe some folks don't even know that we have that. That's also a great resource, and you can actually use that app to go directly to our website. You can use that app to. Um, go to the Hunt Fish PA uh, site to get your license. You can use that app to, to get your boat registered or at least uh, re-registered uh, and get your launch permits all from, all from that, that mobile app. And, and that itself is also a great resource. You can find, uh, find areas that are local waterways near you. Uh, these water mm -hmm. trails, they're listed on there. Um, a, lot, a lot of great things from there and uh, yeah. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, there's so I do have a uh, question for Shane too. Um, what was the most number of fish that you have ever caught in one day or or night? <laughs> well, <laughs> depends what kind of fish you're you're talking about because uh, I break everything down into species. Um, and, and to be Really honest, you know, I, I don't carry a clicker with me to count all my fish. So we, we do try to, to keep it memory because usually there's a couple of us, at least two to three guys when we do these types of things. Um, we try to buddy fish, you know, it's, it's good to have somebody around gets to get hurt. But we've done 230 bass in one day. And it was a phenomenon. I have never seen it before in my life. I'm getting up there in age and it would only ever happen one time. And that was, uh, I believe it was shiners, probably 200 yards long, shiners so thick you couldn't see through them. Um, just thousands of them, I mean, millions of shiners and thousands of bass feeding on these things. And it didn't matter what you had on, you could have threw a flower on a hook and threw it out there and you would have caught them. Um, we caught so many fish that they actually dropped two guys off, picked up another guy and went back out. and. We, wow. we went from uh, from daylight to, to nighttime. <laughs> that sounds like a good day. Great day. Yeah, it, like I said, it's never happened since and never happened before that. So it's just kind of phenomenal. Now, flathead catfish, we've done close to 100 in, in one evening. Wow. Um, and I would say we probably got eight or 10 of those is probably over 30 pounds. 
Um, word. But that's a lot. That's a lot of bait. It's a lot of work and a lot of hours. You know, we're, we're talking going out from six p.m. until nine o'clock the next morning. So, yep. There's. Do you have um, a favorite place that you would go for for smallmouth, or is that a secret? Well, <laughs> you know, you try not to burn spots because even though I don't frequent the same place all the time, I, I was just telling uh, your husband, actually, that at some point when you're fishing, you start leaving the things that work behind to do the things that you want to do, fish the way you want to fish, you know, um, but I would say my favorite place, the most productive place I feel you're gonna fish is from Duncannon down to Fort Hunter. I, I think that is probably one of the most productive smallmouth fisheries or areas to fish that we have on the river uh, consistently. However, fish do move. And at that point in time, I do like Dock Street Dam. So above or below it, I don't care whether I'm at City Island, they got really nice deep pockets there and you go below it, you got a, a lot of shelves and stuff like that to fish as well. Not to mention the dam in itself, which I will just throw out a reminder, it's 100 feet, stay away from that. They will watch you. I've uh, been at 105 feet and had the Fish and Boat Commission come out and let me know that I was within five feet of distance. So just a little FYI for you guys running boats out by Dock Street. Watch your P's and Q's because they're watching you, bud. Um, but yeah, I would, I, Harrisburg area, how's that? I would say that's probably my favorite smallmouth. My favorite flathead area would be south of that. And I'll, I'm gonna pinch it a little bit. I'm gonna say from Route 30 Bridge all the way down to Conowinga Reservoir. If I was in one after monster flathead catfish, that's where I would go. Okay. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, so let's see, Brooke uh, put in the Susquehanna River Trail.org website in the chat if you wanted to learn more about that. Uh, we also do, I'm sure you can buy them online, but we also do sell, I believe it's the middle section um, of the river trail here in the, the nature shop at Wildwood Park. So if you're ever around, you can stop in and get that or you can find it online, I'm sure too. Um, Sharon asked, how frequently does the Fish Commission stock the river? Is there a particular season when the stocking is done? Well, <clears throat> with most of our warm water fisheries, which the Susquehanna River is one, we really don't do much stocking. Most of those, most of those populations are entirely natural reproduction. Um, the only species right now, and since we're kind of focusing on the middle of Susquehanna, I'll talk about that one primarily. The only species we're stocking right now are musclunge, um, a big, uh, large predator. Uh, fun to catch, get upwards of 50 inches in length. Um, and right now they're being stocked every other year. Um, we stock most of the warm water fish as juveniles and allow them to grow out to size because the they don't do well in hatchery systems. So keeping them for a prolonged period of time doesn't work out. So we're usually stocking them either as fry, fingerlings, or yearlings. Um, so we've now moved to a more yearling focused musky stocking program because it is more effective. Those fish survive better and actually contribute more. We're about three or four years into this process, um, a few stocking cycles now. Um, and since survival is better, we need to reevaluate everything. <laughs> it's everything based on our, our fingerling stocking. But yes, we're stocking them at larger size. The survival is much better. Um, but that's the only species in that stretch of river we're actually stocking right now. And it's every other year. Well, that's not exactly true. Um, we are stocking American eel elvers too as part of a reintroduction program. Um, so we are moving them with US Fish and Wildlife and the dam operators in the lower portion of the river around the lower dams and putting them in um, to, to move upstream and provide ecosystem services. So yes, we are stocking those but from a fishing standpoint. Muscalange is the only thing that we put in this section of the river right now. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I know uh, last, at our last lecture, um, Aaron from yes. the SRPC talked a little bit about that, the eel stocking too. Yep. So that was great. So thank you. Yep. Um, and next, sure. I didn't even read it yet. You're ahead of me. As I say, does <laughs> the amount of- Somehow some view I have makes it pretty easy. So yes. um, 
current um, does affect uh, fish and, and where they go and it in, in a number of different ways. So fish and or the fish's food is generally quite lazy. So typically looking for places outside of the current. So as current increases, they'll move to places that are have less current. Um, and and it, it could be relative, you know, it could be a lot of water, so that everything's fast. Well, they'll find the place with the least amount so that they can re rest. Um, and think about them, they're constantly on a treadmill, they're constantly burning energy, trying to fight that current. So they're going to go to the place where there's the least, or their food's going to the place so that there's least, and they'll, they'll do that. As it drops in summer and you have less velocity, sometimes they actually use that flow to their advantage, and it can bring them a conveyor belt of food. Um, so they will sit on the edge of that current and feed as that food comes to them. So they really utilize current differently during different times of the year and for different things. Um, species that are migratory, that high flow in the fall or the spring, they'll use it to move. Um, so uh, in the in the fall, a high flow event will actually be the cue for the American shad to leave. They will take off down river, ride that wave of high water so they don't have to expend as much energy getting back to the ocean. So Kind of different factors affect um, how they re relate to flow, but nine chances out of 10, they are trying to get out of it. So, you know, if it's a flood event, you'll find them up in the trees, sometimes on shore, just it, it breaks the current, just space energy, and they can survive there and handle it without expending as much energy. In the winter, they'll keep, go to the deepest, slowest place possible because there's less food available to them and they don't have to burn as much either. Their metabolism slows as well. So. They're going to a place that kind of allows them the best opportunity to survive and make it through whatever conditions the worst, in this case, the winter, to survive for the next year. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. I think, I think we got all the questions so far. Um, again, if you think of anything, you can type that in the chat box for us, and we will make sure that we get to that. So just a little recap um, with links and, and things, uh, you can check out the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission for more information about what Jeff and Dee were talking about, and also for a list of those guide services that Shane had mentioned. Um, Brooke put in the Susquehanna River Trail org website to go to for more information um, and for Matt for Susquehanna Outfitters, um, I believe it's SusquehannaOutfitters.com and they have all of their information on there. Uh, so please check those out and support those. And uh, I did add the Friends of Wildwood website in there as well at the top of the chat. So Ann, if there's no other questions, Coming in, I think we can wrap this up for the evening. Um, there at Susquehanna, yep, SusquehannaOutfitters.com if you'd like to know more information about them and look into maybe some of their guided floats. So, oh, here's Don. He said, how far north of Harrisburg can you float downstream in a boat? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Matt? Uh, I, I can I can take that one. Uh, I would not recommend starting in Harrisburg and floating down uh, just because you have the Dock Street Dam a half mile from our site, which is about halfway in between City Island. So you have that Dock Street Dam there. And and uh, it doesn't take, especially when the water level is a bit elevated, it doesn't take much time to travel a half mile on the river. And unfortunately, it seems almost about like once a year, somebody ends up ending their life at the Dock Street Dam. So it's very important that you know your hazards and all of that. So no, I would not recommend starting in Harrisburg and floating down without knowing uh, all your different hazards. Oh, above Harrisburg, okay. Um, uh, what else we got? Um, has the Susquehanna River ever had intermittent flow reversal? Not sure if I understand quite. Like it's not, like it's not tidal in that uh, area, but uh, like it wouldn't be until after the Conowingo Dam, a bit further 
downstream. And then to clarify with the, um, yeah, Don's, Don's question here, or yeah, his clarification of his question, sorry, above Harrisburg. So uh, I'm trying to think of the next dam up, um, but you can float quite a way. I know Sunbury might be the next dam up, but yeah, from just below Sunbury down to Harrisburg, you wouldn't have too many hazards other than just shallow water and rocks. Okay. Um, but a very, very pretty section to do as well. Sure. There's, oh, I think Brooke, did you want to add something, Brooke? Yeah, I was just going to add to what Matt said. Just, I would just add that there is just about a mile or so below the Faber Dam at Sunbury, there's another little dam um, at the, it's now a natural gas power plant at, um, I guess that's, it's right there at Shemokin Dam, basically. And that, um, and that's a hazardous dam too at certain water levels, and it's and the it's also a marked dam, so you have to you have to portage around that as well. But so yeah, once you're south of that, that's at Byers Island. Once you're south of Byers, then yeah, you have like a 51 mile stretch of open water, uh, dam free the whole way down to uh, past Matt Shop and and uh, at, at, to the Dock Street Dam. So that's a nice. That's, I mean, one of the appeals of the middle section water trails because it's, yeah, you don't have to worry about dams in between those locations. Oh, that's great. That is a really nice section. There's, is, um, would anyone be able to answer or maybe help out with Justin's question about the intermittent flow reversal? I would I would say something. I don't know if I'm familiar with that term, but we can look that up and, and answer that for you, Justin. So, okay. I think with that, then we will end our lecture for this evening. So again, thank you to all of our speakers tonight uh, for working with us, working through this. Like I said, this is the first time that we have had this many speakers on one lecture series, especially virtual like this, and it went wonderfully. So thank you again, everybody. Also, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, please, you can still add them in the chat or you can email me and I will do my best to get those answered for you. And this ends our lecture series for this year. And please stay tuned for next year. We're already starting to think of some ideas. So we will, start up again next year in January. So thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye.